Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us this Monday evening. I pray that things have been going well um, for you this past weekend. Um, I know at my church we had uh, what's called a uh, gold pink, gold blue. Um, for those, we try to honor those who have gone through cancer treatments and things like that and just think about our health in regards to those type things. So um, we do encourage you to be screened and checked on a regular basis where that's concerned. I also hope that you've been um, taking care of yourself just in general. You know, um, I was thinking about uh, I wasn't able to do it this weekend, but right now this is a time to get your flu shots. This is the time to get um, your booster if you haven't gotten one. Um, this is just to help us stay healthy. You know, it's, it's it can get pretty bad out there nowadays um, and we want you to stay healthy and for nothing else but to be able to serve our Lord, you know, and the Lord wants us to have healthy, whole bodies. OK, so I encourage you to do that and get out there, do some walking right now. It's a beautiful time, beautiful time to walk. Um, let me engage my microphone. That should sound a whole lot better to you now. Um, once you get out there and walk, you know, beautiful time to walk. This is a good time to look at the leaves as you walk, things like that. And um, just just enjoy life. You know, God created us so that we can enjoy uh, this world as uh, the creation that he made it. But more importantly, enjoy him while we are here. And I want you to be able to enjoy him as well. Just it just taking um, this beautiful time of year is one of my favorite times of the year because it just shows um, just how magnificent he has been in creating this world for us to enjoy. And it's nothing like seeing those leaves and all those beautiful colors and things like that and walking by the stream, things like that. I love I love this time of year. I really do. Um, so with all that being said, uh, make sure you check in. Make sure you say hi when you come in. Uh, say something in the comments. Um, I'm happy to bring back to you uh, this week because we had some technical difficulties last week. Um, both with Facebook and some connections and things like that. So I wanted to bring uh, this gentleman back on because I was really enjoying the conversation we was having. I was really intrigued by, by what he was saying. Um, and you know what? I didn't think about it last week, but um, he's actually in Cambodia and I didn't click in my mind. I was going through so much stuff last, last um, week. Um, I didn't even click in my mind that with him being in Cambodia, that means he is, I think it's 11 hours ahead of us. So it's it's more like five something or six something in the morning for him um, and for him to get up. Because I know I usually get up 545 here when I go to work. Uh, so I know I would cherish being able to sleep in an extra hour or whatever. So I really, truly appreciate you being here with us, uh, Matthew, coming up or oh, getting up so early. Yeah, thank you for having me. No, no problem. Yeah. Um, so you know what? Let me let me just start. There. Well, one, how often do you get back to the states? Uh, went home 2019 for Christmas, and then COVID got up and running. Got mm -hmm. stuck there, couldn't get back. The the flights were all down, so I was there for about ten months, and then back here October 2020, and since then haven't been back haven't home. Been back. So Lord willing, mm -hmm. we'll be back. Uh, mid-December for a little over a month and then then back here so typically go home and uh, engage uh, a few churches that support and and that sort of thing after Christmas so looking forward to doing that okay so, yeah so, that's yeah. what I was going to ask did you come back just to visit family or do you go and come to raise money to help you on your mission field yes so typically okay. Like the, the idea here would be to visit family, go for a hike with dad up on the hill behind the house and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And in January, have a few Sundays open. So we'd love to come to your church. I would love to have you come by, truly, <laughs> truly. Um, so let me just bring up your page real quick. Is there, um, is there a uh, place on here where people can actually make a do donation? Uh, up up there on top, there's a toolbar. It says support mission. Support mission. There it is. I thought I saw it. I just couldn't see it in that moment. Okay. So there it is, y'all. Um, you know, if you would love to support Matthew's mission, you know, and he's going to talk a little bit more about what that's all about and what is it that he does on a regular basis. 
um, you can go there and you know you can so support the mission that way. You can see their doctrinal um, statement and everything like that. That's always important. I always like to know what it is that people believe and why they do what they do. You know, just because people call themselves Christian don't mean um, that they necessarily believe the same things that um, we believe as a community. All right. Mm -hmm. So just make sure, um, take some time with it. And uh, if the Lord lays it on your heart to support this this ministry, you know me, I try my best to support um, fertile ground. You know, I believe in planting in fertile ground. And mm -hmm. I, I think this is a good one. Um, but read it for yourself. Just like I tell you, read the read the Bible for yourself. You know, don't just listen to me. OK. Um, or in this case today, Matthew. But um, read it for yourself with the Lord's help. He will reveal it to you properly. OK. Mm -hmm. if, so if you, if you click ahead. that, if you click that support mission, it goes to a whole other website. That's that's all the mission in Cambodia. OK. And so all that right. gives the monthly update, September ministry highlights. It, it's kind of generalized because uh for people who you know for any anyone out there reading but if anybody wants a more specific version they can click the contact i can send them more specifics typically uh you know pictures and that sort of thing of exactly what i'm doing every month good good okay well like i said i wanted to make sure we we got um Matthew back on because i just i just wanted to have a little bit more conversation with him and talk about some things um concerning what he does you know about his life um where he's come from how god has brought him um, through some things as well um we were talking earlier before we came on about some scriptures and last time we talked about uh first corinthians we just kind of hit on it first corinthians 6 9 through 11 you know um and you know what i'll put that up we can go through that real quick it says do not do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor um, revilers, um, nor uh, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And we kind of talked about how you have this great list. And Matthew, you said you, you stated last time, um, I don't care who you are, you can find yourself someplace at one time or another, or even currently someplace within this list. Amen. Right. So um, I think this is why this is probably one of those scriptures that I've read in the past um, that made me realize I absolutely have no right to judge anyone. Right. I, I have no I, ha, I have no right to look at one person and say, well, your sin is this. My sin is that. But your sin is a whole lot worse. No. Um, when you look at this list, you can see it's not even um, necessarily what happened here. Uh -oh. It's not even necessarily um, in uh, alphabetical order. It's not it's not numerical in any kind of way. It's just those okay. things that that are against what God's will is for our lives. And these are some of the things that he does not um, or will not allow to come into his kingdom. Okay. Amen. Amen. What's your position there, Matthew? Because, um, well, I guess I know, but what, what's your position? It's like when once we die, how are we then, since we have this list of things, right? And we will carry these things until death. Do you truly believe that the blood of Christ has covered it all and will cover it all? And that's what gives us our entrance into heaven. Ver verse 11 says that uh, and such were some of you. So, so 9 and 10 is kind of the bad news. Verse 11 is the good news. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So... Paul, inspired by the Lord, is, is writing to the church in Corinth here. And obviously there were people there in the audience who were what we, what we call today, for lack of a better term, ex-gay, who had repented and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, stopped following their deceitful hearts and had chosen to follow, to turn away from, from their deceitful hearts to follow the Lord Jesus Christ according to his word. And, and uh, 
So, so homosexual sin is just as forgivable as covetousness, for example, drunkenness, alcohol abuse, or any of the other sins listed. And that's, that's pretty humbling because I think, like you said, everybody in the church has committed one of those sins. So typically if I'm going to a church, that's usually how I would open up. Has anybody mm -hmm. not committed one of these sins? Right. And, and yes, yes, I do believe that if someone repents and puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, continues to struggle, uh, perhaps, you know, in, in whatever sin was their kind of tendency in their past life, um, but continues to, to repent and start every day new, that, that it really is covered in the blood. The Bible Absolutely. says that, it, that a true born-again believer will not continue in sin, right? So if I'm, uh, I, I use the kind of extreme example sometimes, if, if I'm a seeker, I'm an LGBT seeker, and I'm a man who wears makeup and high heels and, and all that, and I come into your church, if you're, if you're preaching the full counsel of God that homosexuality is sin, but it's forgivable, right, if I repent and put my faith and trust in him, and I claim that I've already repented and given my life to Christ, but I continue to come back for five years with the same makeup and the same high heels, probably something didn't take, right? There's probably my, my conversion wasn't genuine. So it's, it's not a, an excuse to continue in sin. The Bible says that, that those who truly know the Lord and are born again have repented will not continue in the long term in a practice of sin that the Lord will chastise those he loves to bring us to repentance. Yes. So so how is your preaching, when you're preaching about that particular sin, how is that received? Is it received differently in Cambodia versus um, here in the States? Is there a lot of pushback? What what goes on there? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I grew up in the church and then I went out and followed my heart and the Lord brought me back through some tough stuff. Praise the Lord for second chance. But um, so I remember kind of growing up in the church, very kind of missions minded church. It was a pretty good sized Christian missionary alliance church in, in small town, Pennsylvania. And we used to talk about the 1040 window, about the unreached people groups over in Southeast Asia and, and other right. places. And that's where right. I am now, the, the 1040 window. It's like, wow, the like a, a darkness, a kind of a black hole kind of concept spiritually and, and other other ways, too. And uh, so you would imagine that my ministry would, would encounter all kinds of opposition over here. and People would be putting their dukes up and ready to fight. And it's actually opposite, believe it or not. The, hmm. the, the nation that was founded to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the United States, that has been a light shining in the darkness for generations, has now turned a corner and, and now is... I, if I go home and share the gospel in a Walmart one-on-one -on -one to a guy, I call it relational evangelism. I, you know, kind of make friends with somebody that's working there or something. I can, I, it appears that he identifies to be gay. That's happened before. Just share my raw testimony, nothing pointing to him or, or insinuating anything about him, just sharing my experience and what the Lord's done for me. Oh, my goodness. Encountered all kinds of backlash from from. Wow their families uh, coming at me through Facebook later on. I'm from a small town, so everybody wow. knows everybody. And uh, through the drive through and a Taco Bell one time shared with somebody and all kinds of backlash that was heard throughout the community later on. And um, so over here, Cambodia, there's, there's still that, it's a little bit what, what it would, what it would have been like, I think in Baltimore, maybe two or three generations ago, there's a respect for elders, a respect for mm. those old, than you so people will say thank you even if they don't agree right right <laughs> and that, then they kind of leave it at that so uh it's, wow. it's a whole different world over here it's opposite of what you might think but yeah. I'm, I'm blessed to be over here and i, I kind of consider it to be training wheels in a way that the lord has me in a place that's that's still kind and sweet and respectful of elders i have some gray hair now so it works well right. for me and um uh, Lord willing, I, I really feel that at some point in the future, the Lord will have me back in the U.S. to kind of engage and be part of that war that's raging over homosexuality that causes so much of an uproar there. I think we need a voice on the right side of the war, uh, speaking for the Lord, speaking Bible truth. So uh, is the population over there primarily Buddhist believers? Or is there a large uh, group of Christians there or is that... 
uh, is, are the Christians the most definitely the minority? I'm looking at you, shaking your head. They're the, they're the minority. Yeah, most definitely. They they say, uh, I don't know how they figure it, but they say that roughly 96% of the population identifies as Buddhist. So it's really, it's really difficult to wrap your mind around until you get over here and start talking to people. Um, the U.S. and Western countries typically are I kind of mentalities, every man for himself, and I have my own plan for my life and get out of my way and, and all that kind of stuff. And over here, it's we. We help mm -hmm. each other, and, mm -hmm. and that's so, it's so uh, heartwarming in so many ways. But when it comes to the spiritual, it can be a real uh, stumbling block for people because the family is saying, you are Cambodian, therefore you are Buddhist. And mm -hmm, to walk mm -hmm. away from that is to turn your back on your entire heritage, your entire right. culture. Right. There's uh, ancestor worship, for example, giving uh, sacrifices to the demonic. So that Satan's trying to steal, steal worship from, from the Lord as he did in eternity past. And nowadays over here, keeping people in fear that if they don't offer sacrifices to the spirits of their ancestors to get them a better reincarnation, to transfer merit, that they will be cursed by the evil spirit. So they're in fear of of the demonic, walking in fear of Satan in a very literal way. Wow. And uh, giving sacrifices to Satan, thinking that it's to help their grandma who passed away. And so there's a lot of stuff going on that um, it takes a while to really understand. I have a teacher here that helped me a lot to understand the culture and, and language and everything, just invaluable how the Lord used him. Because if you're you're coming into a place like this and saying, Jesus loves you, he died on the cross for your sins, he created you, um, you must repent and put your faith and trust in him. For somebody who never heard that before, it's like an alien concept. So right, they're, right. they're thinking, I don't really understand what you're saying, so I default to everything I've been indoctrinated to. Where I, where I can't understand, I'm defaulting back to, I think you're just wanting me to be a good person. So they'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. my summary of what you just said is that all religions are the same. Everyone right. wants to be a good person. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> right, right. So you, so you explain that that uh, Jesus Christ is the one true God, that, that everything was created through him, that he's without sin, came from heaven to earth to die on the cross for our sins. He is the final sacrifice. He paid for the sins of the whole world 100% already. We can't do good to earn our right. way to heaven. We must repent right. and say, I'm sorry, I'm bad, you are good. I believe that Jesus Christ is the one true God, the Lord of all, and I put my faith and trust in him. And then I can get to heaven because he's good, not because I'm good, but because right. I repented and he washed me clean in his blood and forgave me. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So he's the one Amen. door to heaven. Amen. That's good. You just you just gave us the whole gospel just a little bit of time. That's good. Um yeah, real. I mean, and that's the amazing thing about you know being a Christian. We are the only religion who has the one true living God as the head, you know, and we we understand that yeah, because of the debt that we owe, not to him, but the debt of death, you know, because we all come in here with that debt, you know, there's nothing we can do to ever pay that off. And only he was able to pay that off because he is God himself. You know, and we thank Jesus for doing that for us. Um, oh, that was good. I really appreciate that. So we talked about it a little bit, and we was going to ref, um, refer to Romans one twenty four, and I and I kind of tie this like with a lot of other people how we look at um, the United States, and oftentimes people look at Romans one, on uh, and other books, even in Revelation, and. Um, they, they try to figure out where the United States is in this process, if you want to call it a process, if you want to call it a history thing. Um, so um, we're going to read Romans 1, 24. We're going to read it in the New King James Version, and then we'll kind of talk about it from there. And it says this. It says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. And if you want to stop at any point, feel free to stop me as I'm going through Matthew. Um gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. 
um, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creator. I'm, I'm sorry, and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For, uh, for this reason, God gave them up to vow passions for even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, um, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. And men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. All Amen. right. Amen. So so go a, ahead. Lot of folk, a lot of folks here at the end receiving in themselves the penalty of the error, which was due, would point to STD, specifically HIV. Um, for this passage, and in, in really it kind of starts at verse 20, maybe goes to verse 32, so it's really giving the why for homosexuality, and I think it's so often overlooked to our, uh, I think we need to really to, to get into here to explain to folks where is this coming from. And so this is really pointing back, I feel, to the creation account. So God created the first man, the first woman, we sinned against him. And ever since then, their, their offspring, each of us on earth, regardless of how cleaned up we appear to be, we have a sinful nature, we're fallen creations. And it says that we've, we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We can see his creation. It's, it's marvelous. It's miraculous from the food chain to Mount Everest to the human body and how it functions so perfectly. Even though we've, we've caused a tremendous amount of decay in the Lord's creation, it's still miraculous. It's still brilliant. It speaks of an, of an almighty, all-knowing God. And so we have no excuse. We can see that he exists and who he is. Even without reading the Bible, we can see that. And um, we chose to exchange the truth about God to worship the creature rather than the creator. So in my case, I use as an example, and I think a lot of, a lot of men like me, especially out in the gay community, worship ourselves. We're, we're a creation of God, right? And here we are looking at ourselves in the mirror and making an idol of ourselves. And I think that's kind of a, a modern American thing beyond the LGBT. But, but the Bible says here that because of that, God gave us up to a reprobate mind, void of judgment. We, ex we exchanged natural affections for the unnatural, the, the twisted, perverted. So God created woman to be man's helpmate, to be joined together as one flesh. And uh, Satan perverted that. So he's twisting yeah. and de deceiving people that they're, they, they are something based on their temptation. And the Bible says that we all have temptation to some kind of sin, and it doesn't define us any, any more than somebody who wakes up every day and is tempted to lie or cheat or steal is not a liar, uh, liar, uh, thief or cheat, right? Unless they go out and act on that. So the same thing with homosexuality. I have that desire, that temptation. If I'm not acting on it, it's certainly not who I am, right? I can repent, put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, choose to believe that I am who he says I am, which is a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, and it's, and, uh, it's a, the thought of, you, you call it just being selfish. You know, um, I, th I think it's pride. I call it pride. I, um, I think it really comes down to um, we choose the things we choose to do things because of what we believe is what we want and what's best for us based on what the flesh desires. Right. So we're paying more attention to the me instead of to God. Um, we're paying, we paying more attention. And I was just talking about this the other day. Um, we're paying more attention to um, what the flesh desires as opposed to what God desires. And you, you said it um, from the very beginning, um, once the enemy got in his foot into the door of the garden, if you will, um, he decided that he was going to turn anything that God created, anything that God wanted, he wanted to pervert it and turn it. And his sole mission is to take that, the liberties that we would normally have away. You know, he comes to kill, steal, to kill, steal, and destroy. So um, it's, it's like, 
it, it really comes down to what is it and who is it that you really want to serve? You know, yeah. uh, is do you really want to serve you? Okay. And you're always going to end up losing if you're just looking at yourself or do you want to serve God? You know, and who who is it that you really look for your true salvation from? And I think um, when it comes to the United States, I, th I think that we it's like we're, we're we've gotten this thought and image of that we're the greatest country in the world, and it's because of what we've done. Amen. And we when we are so great, and because we're so great, we have the right to do whatever we want to do. Amen. Right, and we we've kind of forgotten. You know that, like you said, we were a nation that foundationally had Christ at the center. Now there are those who would argue that you know that not all of our um, founding fathers were believers or or Christians like we thought they should be Christians, yeah. but the Bible was at least there in the midst of it, and it was used as a guide. Did they follow it exactly the way God probably intended it? Probably not. You know, were there mistakes made? Sure, certainly there were some mistakes made, but there was the basis of God's will at the center of it, and we've gotten away from it. And I think that's why our country is in such um, a state that it's in now. You know, Amen. even when you look at former presidents, most recent former presidents, it's just you saw a lot of pride. You saw a lot of um, narcissism, you know, the narcissistic. Um, and when you look at the gov the ruling governors and all that, that's what you see now. You don't see those who are doing things for the people. They're doing it for themselves. And that's not what God intended. I think of the Israelites when the when the Lord parted the Red Sea and they get over to the other side. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And they're singing and everything. And then just a short time after that, they're bowing down to a statue again. Over here yeah. in the in this culture in Cambodia, it's idolatry. And it's tough for the American mind present day to, to fathom why somebody would, would think to bow down to something that's made of wood or, you know, metal. That seems outrageous, but, but it's indoctrinated and ingrained in the culture over here like it was back then. And so it's a little easier to understand when you get over here and see why they're doing it. It's a lot of fear based in, in the demonic. But in the U.S., we make, uh, we make a, a, an idol of each other of ourselves hmm. so we so like you said we in the beginning we're saying praise the lord praise the lord and the lord blesses beyond measure and blessed beyond measure and blessed beyond measure and most powerful country in the world and then a, a few years later human nature takes hold and it's like um i think that actually came from my own doing i think right it's, right i'm, I'm an my amazing own imagination guy. yeah i'm an amazing guy and so strong and and worked so hard and Praise me, not praise the Lord. And, and so here we are. We've turned away to worship ourselves. When, when you kind of get out of the, the U.S. context for a little bit, it, it's really eye-opening when you get over here to another culture and you're kind of seeing it's so different over here. So it's like being on, a, on another planet in so many ways. And um, I reflect back on things at home and, and how things are here, how the culture dominates, like the cultural norms are rooted and grounded in Buddhism over here. So you get into this and you're trying to witness in the middle of this when people are saying, but I'm Cambodian, but I'm Buddhist. And then you're like, it's not like that back in the US, we're different. And then it's like, no, wait a minute, are we really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, yeah. then you, wa you watch the Hollywood movie and it's like, we just babble the things that Hollywood tells us, just like any other culture. Like we think we're so great and we think for ourselves and we're independent and we're so free. We're really rooted and grounded and controlled by the Hollywood narrative. Right. So you watch yeah. a Hollywood movie and the number one thing in the Hollywood movie, especially like a romantic comedy or something is, um, well, Cassandra just wanted to be happy and she wasn't happy with Dan. And so they, they had irreconcilable differences because she wasn't happy anymore. What does, does the Bible guarantee that anyone, even a believer, would have 25-7 happiness throughout their life? Why is that the goal? It's the goal because Satan made it the goal because he knows that it's impossible in, in the fallen world that we have. So we will never be satisfied if the goal is unattainable. Right. Even in Christ, we cannot be 25-7 
happy in our circumstances because we live in a shipwreck of a world by our by our own sin right problems right. all over the place so we have the joy and the peace of the lord if we know him that rises above those those problems of life but we don't have what hollywood calls happiness like right. if we're, if we're if which we're is being, fake anyway if we're being pulled away from the word of god and, and a lot of believers are allowing themselves to be and then conditioned to think my goal is to be happy and when i'm not happy with my mate it's time to jump ship that's what satan's mm -hmm. up to so he's yeah. flipping something and and then we we buy into it as though it's bible truth because it sounds relatively similar well the lord wants us to have joy the joy of the lord is our strength right so it's relatively but it's not yeah yeah demonic. yeah since, since you brought up hollywood and, and you're absolutely right um it used to be that art imitates life but now life is imitating art and mm -hmm. whatever the art that's being put out there um whatever they're saying is what we kind of start to do and not only that not just here in the states it gets shipped and exported to other countries as well and other countries look at us and thinking that what they're seeing in the movies is how it is in the united states all over and it's all fabricated it's all it's all a lie and we know that the uh father of lies is satan you know mm -hmm. but he has a way of making things look beautiful you know making it seem like it's all natural um, when we know it's not, you know, when you really take the time to examine God's word, you know that the things that's being projected on the screen is false. It's a falsehood, you know, um, but for whatever reason, we believe if we go someplace for two hours and watch something, oh, that must be how life is supposed to be. And I don't have that. So I'm going to do something else. And I'm going to walk away from what God has given me to get mm -hmm. or attain something that I probably could never get anyway, you know. And then if they do reach some measure of that, they still find themselves to be unhappy because what they really need is Christ. What they really need is God. They're trying to fill that that hole that uh, you know, I always call it that puzzle piece. It's like you got this piece inside of you that only God can fit, only God can fill, and only he can um, make you feel satisfied um, and fulfilled in that area of your life. And until you find that, you're always going to be miserable. You're always going to feel like you have the shortcoming, you know? And, um, you know, we listen to be listening to the media way too much. You know, I think that's how why a lot with our youth nowadays, um, with social media and all that, it's harder to get them engaged because they've been fed with so much nonsense through, you know, like Twitter and Instagram, Facebook. And I don't, I don't care what the social media uh, platform is. It's it, it puts out this falsehood, this fake image of what life is supposed to be instead of really living life as it should be Amen. you know um i, I went on a tangent and forgot what i was going to say now um i do see that my mom is on hey mom love you haven't talked to you yet today but love you hope you had a great day um hey listen y'all um if you're out there say something in the comments ask a question i'm sure matthew wouldn't mind i'm answering the question if you want to uh give us a call you can give us a call at 410-513-9499. I'm sure you wouldn't mind talking to you directly as well. Okay. Um, so uh, I agree with everything that you you said thus far. And, and typically, um, I, I ask three questions. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to, to share when it comes to yeah. Romans? Uh, the one thing when you're, you're asking folks to call in to kind of hopefully make people feel comfortable um, back in small town Pennsylvania where I'm from kind of old coal mining town now a Walmart town it's uh, when I was growing up it was so rural and homosexuality wasn't really addressed kind of brushed under the rug and like I said I was home for about 10 months over COVID and got into some churches there the Lord opened some doors praise God and what we found in those churches was that even in the smallest town, most remote, remote, remote churches, there is typically one family nowadays that has a son or daughter who went off to, for example, Chicago or, or New York or something is living a gay lifestyle. So it's, uh, I think nearly everybody nowadays has somebody in their family or someone close to them who's struggling with homosexuality. So uh, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. Uh, Absolutely. Reflect, reflecting on scripture, we shouldn't be afraid to to bring it up, and uh, you don't have to share your name if you call in. 
Oh, no, absolutely. And, and, and really, we'll be here for probably another 20 minutes or so. Um, if you want to call somebody real quick, tell them to check in real fast. Maybe they, they you know, they've been struggling with questions or whatever, or, or this is just an area that they're struggling with. Here's a great opportunity to ask someone who was a part of that lifestyle, came out of that lifestyle um, with the help of Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, he'd be happy to talk to him. Um, I know what I was going to say before. Um, cause you was talking about, uh, Cambodia and, you know, idol worship and what they do over there, things like that. Uh, and it'd be kind of brought to mind, uh, when I went to China, the area of China that I was in, it was, um, Buddhist and Muslims primarily in that area. So Christianity has started to get in there, um, but it was definitely the minority and they did have, um, a Christian church, but it was state run you know yeah. um so um I know I'm, I'm trying to be careful about just what i say but the one thing that i and i'm sure you'll probably say the same thing about the cambodians is that the right term cambodians yeah um while the people were very nice and they were very um cordial uh they they were respectful and things like that. Um, and they were happy. I'll even say in some cases they were happy. Uh, the one thing that I picked up on when I would look into their eyes and when I would talk to some of them um, was that they were missing joy. And I wonder, do you do you get that same sense? Um, and when I say they don't, they didn't have the joy, it's like they were just living, but it wasn't living like um, they had the joy of the Lord because I, I can definitely tell the difference when someone is living the joy of the Lord, even though they may be going through something at the moment, you know, because like you said, being a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to have your challenges. Being a Christian doesn't mean that there aren't going to be bad days, right? Um, yeah. That there aren't going to be trials and tribulations if you <laughs> want to get all biblical, right? Um, but you still have this joy. You still have this hope. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I, I picked up on within the day. It was like they're, they're, they, they, they're, like I said, they're cordial, they're respectful, they smile, they'll talk to you. But behind it all, you didn't get a sense of joy. Amen. Yes. You know? Is that the same way there? Yes. Just like uh, unbelievers everywhere, really. Anyone who, who doesn't have Christ, there's there's fear. There's uh, kind of the, the humdrum of the, the day in and day out that we all feel, but but without Christ, that's especially a humdrum, right? It's it's pretty life is pretty monotonous and, and feels yeah. pretty point, pointless if you don't know the Lord, you don't know your purpose, you don't know that this life is a short waiting period to make a decision for Him, and then we mm. go to eternal glory if we've accepted, if we rejected, go to eternal damnation. Um, that changes everything. It puts some passion behind evangelism. Those of us who know him, we, we, we want to get out and witness, tell people about him before it's too late. People are dying every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's something that I, I know my church is currently really starting to refocus on. Um, we're currently doing a Bible study on end times. Um, and when you start to read about the end times, that should also give you a passion about going out to talk to people about Christ, you know, so that they're not lost and they don't have to go through uh, the tribulation period and all that, um, because we are pre-trib. Um, just put that out there. Um, Mark, you said that you're the evangelism pastor or outreach pastor. Um, I'm the evangelism leader. I, I call myself the leader director, if you will. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very hesitant about calling myself a pastor. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know I lead people, um, but I jokingly say, which may not be as much of a joke, uh, Christians get on my nerves and I'm not, yeah. a pastor. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I get, I get, I've, 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 I've walked my bishop, my pastor 53, I think now years, um, he's been pastoring the church and, um, just watching how he interacts and engages with people um, is at a different level. And I know God hasn't called me to that level. And I'm fine with that. 
You know, uh, you know, not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. You know, yeah. not everybody's called to be a teacher. Um, so I'm fine with where I'm at. I don't aspire to have my own church, anything like that. Um, I just want to be a service to the Lord, which is what I told him um, when I first went into ministry. However you want to use me, you can use me. You know, Amen. and that's that's still my statement. Amen. Are you are you alluding to our next topic? Are you going to go into how the church welcomes the LGBT or or not? Sure. What are your thoughts about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so just to recap, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, the Lord brought me to my knees after being out in the gay life for about 10 years and through some tough stuff and praise the Lord gave me a second chance, kind of re-entered the church that I hadn't, I'd been absent for all that time. And so what I found was I kind of consider myself a prodigal of sorts. And so I identify with the prodigal kind of coming back to the family, the dad, the father's kind of running to meet you and throws a party and all that. And then there's the older brother on the sideline, like, ah, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really like, why for him? Why are you throwing a party for him? He went out and made a wreck of his life and you're welcoming right. him back and putting him up on a pedestal and he's up in the front sharing his testimony. Are you kidding me? And so um, I got quite a bit of that and have been really struggling over the years to try to figure it out, to try to interpret what the heck is going on. And I really my church experience is pretty, pretty broad for the, since 2010, I've been in uh, a lot of different churches from, from the U S to over here and in between to share testimony and share the gospel and to share what the Lord's done in my life. He wants to do for other folks. And so I kind of put them into two categories, one for the most part, Baptists, like independent fundamental Baptist or Southern Baptists or whatever kind of Baptist. The other one would be kind of non-denominational, what we might call a modern church. And so in those two buckets, they react to me differently and kind of two, ex two kind of extremes, I guess. The Baptist often, often feels to me like a private club a little bit so that um, hmm. not really open to outsiders coming in, uh, usually strong in doctrine, which is excellent, praise the Lord. But... Um, relatively speaking, but even that kind of falters a bit, I think, in these last days for a lot of churches. But anyway, would would maybe have me come in, but kind of keep me at arm's length, especially when I'm when I'm asked to get up and share my testimony. Then it's typically in a Baptist setting for me, not always, but typically there's a sense of your sin is greater or less forgivable than my sin. Mm -hmm. And and especially when I'm honest about I still struggle with temptation, with homosexual temptation every day. It's my thorn in the flesh, as Paul would say. And so it, it, it generates a greater reliance on the Lord. By necessity, I have to rely and have a good, have a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through his word. I have to be in the word daily, and, and that's a good thing. And so the Lord uses it for ministry. I can still shed a tear for somebody who's struggling because I literally know how it is present day where i right. probably if, I, if it had gone away 10 years ago i'd kind of forget and feel like i've arrived at somewhere and i'm better than somebody else right so the lord uses that and i like to be honest about it because it helps other people rather than to pretend like i'm some kind of finished work and already right. arrived right. in heaven when i do that i get some backlash from the baptist side typically um kind of just marginalized and you're not really able to do what some of the other men are doing because you either haven't done something right or you're doing something wrong in your walk. Mm. Otherwise, all your temptation would be removed, which is a farce. We, we know that everybody struggles with temptation. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the other way is the modern church typically known for kind of wishy-washy doctrine, but on the bright side, typically opens every open to everybody and welcoming to everybody coming in but not always telling them the truth. So you're kind of getting people in to get their, their money, sadly, in, in a lot of cases with churches nowadays. It's to tickle ears, tell people what they want to hear so that they come back next week and you have high right. numbers and good revenue coming in. Ugh. So that makes it rough. So somebody comes in sharing a testimony that calls homosexuality sin which is controversial which can mm -hmm, mm -hmm. reduce revenue reduce attendance right so you're putting me up in the front oh i heard that you came from a gay lifestyle you're probably just going to tell us to love on them huh just show them the love of christ it's like mm. well that 
part of the message. That's a big part, but that's not yeah. the full counsel of God. Right. So I'm going to say it's it's sin, but it's forgivable sin. We must call to re we're called to repentance and faith in Christ, just like any other believer. It's not calling one out over the other. It's just sharing my testimony. Here's what I've learned. Here's what the Lord's done for me. Also, warnings about alcohol. Oh my goodness. A lot of modern churches today are sipping beer to show that we're in, we're under grace. We're not under legalism and so on. To right, try right. to overreact to that so that everybody feels like they can do whatever they want. So I come in sharing that, and it's like, somebody silence this guy. Where's the duct, duct mm, tape? You mm, know what I mean? Right. So typically after a service, then I'll be surrounded once I'm identified as that guy. Then I'll be kind of surrounded like, we, we'd like to make sure that you have proper accountability. You know, every, mm. All the men in the church here have accountability. Even the pastor's accountable to someone. You're accountable to someone, aren't you? And that sort of thing, which sounds amazing and sounds healthy. But in the end, it's really not about healthy accountability. It's about putting a wet blanket on my relationship with Christ. Yeah, I was going to try to say, why, why are they bringing up accountability? What is it that they think you're lacking? They're, when you're honest, once again, just like the Baptist church, when you're honest about, I struggle every day with temptation to sin. I've, re I've repented 12, as of 12 years ago. I have not been with a man in any way, you know, in, in, the, in a homosexual kind of way. Um, and they're saying that, that uh, you're, like, because the temptation didn't go away, I guess is the best way to put it. They're saying that you haven't done something right or you're doing something wrong. So... In other words, they're, they're looking at it, I think, kind of with Hollywood eyes. They're thinking, when somebody comes in and says that they repented out of a gay lifestyle, then we expect that they mean they went from 100% homosexual attracted to 100% heterosexual attracted overnight. Right. Pew! Suddenly, zero temptation toward the same sex and 100% animalistic lust toward women. That's not, that's not reality. That's not right. how it works. That's... That's a farce for everybody. The guy that repents out of alcoholism is still probably going to want a beer the next day. He has to fight that with the power of Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Praise God, we have, we have power to fight. And so the the one that the woman who lied or gossiped yesterday repented, put her faith and trust in Christ is probably going to be tempted toward that. It's just reality. But but the the modern church that what they're really trying to get to is to water down your message to make it like theirs make it something that doesn't reduce revenue that doesn't reduce attendance so just tell them to just tell them to stand up and tell everybody that god is love yeah it's basically yeah. Be, because nobody's going to be offended by they that they don't want to hear about god's judgment and the truth sets people free so if we're if we're calling the lgbt into the church we're calling the calling this this a church we're calling them into the church but we refuse to tell them what the lord really says the full counsel of god it's of no use it's completely useless it's just a a minute a community center right it's like a ymca or something there's no point in even calling it a church if we're not preaching the word of god if the word of god is not first and foremost and held above all our opinions so can, can well, i say well, can i say ahead. one more thing Sure. Uh, it's I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing out of frustration because it's been so many years of this, and it's like either you're going to go completely insane or you're going to start laughing. But um, I, I've been in like in situations where they'll in, in the, the first few times. Okay, so one time in, in uh, Cambodia here, but an American pastor of a Baptist church in Cambodia, I went into the church, and it was my first time in the church. He didn't know me from anybody, just came in for one service, sat through the service. At the end, he comes up to me, identifies me as somebody who hasn't been there before, a new time, first time visitor. So he's walking down the steps with me, talking, you know, where did he come from? So I share testimony with him. And I was identified. So he immediately changed kind of his demeanor. He said, we have children in the church. We are very protective wow. of our children, sir. Wow. And he, he escorted me off the church premises, like wow. went outside to, to guarantee that I had left as though I had been identified as a risk. And I said, my testimony had nothing to do with children. I, in no way did I mention children at all. 
And he said, oh, no, I'm by no means. He said, judgment, by definition, kind of like Webster's definition, making judgment is coming to a final conclusion. Oh, no, I'm not coming to a final conclusion. I'm just saying that we have to. So he's being very clever. So mm -hmm. he's, he's saying, like, you can't fault me with judging you because I didn't arrive at Webster's definition of judgment. But he's basically saying you're a pedophile. Wow. So it's been... Uh, and that wasn't the the only time. There was a much a much more uh, extreme situation that happened in a church where I was serving for uh, over time. I'd, I'd been serving there for about four years back in Pittsburgh, and that's another story that's in the book, book number three. But um, all kinds of stuff. So it, you you kind of you're kind of like, why in the heck is the, are they saying this about me? when there there's no basis for it and then you start to dig in and the bible says the root of all evil is money and it really comes down to you're coming against my very way of life my income hinges on attendance right. and revenue in jeopardy. coming against it yeah and it took a long time yeah it took a long time for the lord to reveal that wow um all right so we're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up i appreciate you giving us your story your testimony I'm a, I'm a, I want to ask you three questions. I ask a lot of the guests these three questions um, as a wrap up. And you kind of already gave us the answer to um, the first question. Um, so I'm still going to ask it and maybe you can give it something a little more um, direct as far as the answer is concerned. Uh, it's just a strong, my brother, God has the final say in everything. Thank you for your sharing. That's from Praise um, the Lord. She's a part of our, our my ministry or our ministry at Mount Pleasant Church and Ministry. Um, so Thank my you. first question, um, and again, you kind of let us know what it's about, but if you could be just a little bit more specific in the timeline or the time frame, um, what happened? What was the thing that happened in your life that really turned you to Christ? Mm -hmm. I know you said you grew up in the church and things like that. Yeah. But what was it? And you may have still been in that lifestyle, you know, when you accepted Christ or whatever. But what was it that really made you or the instance that that you became saved or that you received your salvation? Yeah, I, I grew up in the in the church and I think that's the third time I said that now. But um there was a Christian school next to the church. I was in the youth group, very, very well churched and was learning the Bible and reciting it as part of, I think, Christian school back at the time, reciting verses and for youth group. So I had the, the Lord had those in my mind, right? Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from, from it. And I reference my gray hair when I say when he is old, because I was 32 when the hmm. Lord brought me back. I had some beginnings of some gray hair at the time. But um, he really brought end time scripture and it sounds, it, you know, I, I think nowadays we like to talk about the love of God and, and not really the judgment. But for me, it was really fear of judgment. It was like, I'm not ready to meet him. I know he's coming back in judgment. He had performed miracles in my, my family uh, early on as a child. My mom was in a car accident, uh, the car fishtailed going up a, a kind of an icy mountain and a guy ran into her and he passed away and praise the Lord. He knew, he knew Christ and we believe he's with the Lord now, but it was very traumatic for the family and she had a hard time dealing with it. And the pastor came out and prayed with us. And there was a presence that I will never forget in the room. So the Lord, the Lord really rooted and grounded me in, in like the reality that he really is the living God, that it's not just a, a set of teachings and something from some book but really the Bible is the inspired word of God and he's real and alive and, and he helped us to get through something that, that we couldn't otherwise get through. And so that, that presence stuck with me. I remembered that and I remembered his word. And so when I'm out there acting on the, on my lust, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have an attraction to women. So I felt like, and I think people don't believe me sometimes when I say that because they think gay is a choice. When somebody goes to, to into homosexuality, they've chosen um, a man's anatomy over a woman's. And that's not 
how it is for many of us. We literally don't have a sexual attraction to a woman. How that happens in, in childhood and how Satan comes in and, and offers alternatives and twist things and choices that we make early on is, is kind of another story. But um, you get me to puberty and there's no attraction for women except like a brother-sister kind of attraction. And there's a full-blown attraction for a man, that kind of a budding one, I would say, that then gets becomes full-blown as the fire is added through looking at uh, things that I shouldn't have looked at in my teens and that sort of thing. So um, that got started and got rolling. And then, then when I got into my, to my life out there and couldn't find satisfaction in, in the gay world and, and found out that it was really a fantasy that I had believed lies, that I would be a model one day and all that kind of stuff. And none of that came true. And I was left there with a, with a bucket of addiction and slavery to sin, just walking in circles and not really ever getting to a point of long-term satisfaction, uh, no peace in my heart. And then I was in fear, like, okay, if I continue in this addiction, if I continue in this sin, I'm going to be a quiet funeral, just like so many of my bar mm -hmm. friends, my bar acquaintances, because at that time they were really dropping like flies, people that I knew in that lifestyle. Um, HIV related kind of stuff and suicides and overdoses and all that. And I thought, okay, it's just a matter of time. This is reality. I'm killing myself. You know what I mean? That That's how the Lord kind of awakened me and I'm not ready to meet him. So at one point I was on lunch break in downtown Pittsburgh and I walked down to go into a McDonald's and hundreds of people there on the street and in McDonald's and the guy, a street evangelist followed me into McDonald's, tapped me on the shoulder. He stood behind me out of everybody, he singled me out stood behind me and said, where will you go if you die today? And I thought, wow. okay, so this is proof. Like, it's mm. not just my nagging parents. It's not, this is really the Lord from the throne reaching down to me, but why? You know what I mean? And I was so reluctant to even start into that thought process because it's like, this means that I'm required to do something, right? If I really acknowledge that this is happening... <laughs> Then it's like, oh, so I have to give up everything that I think I am. Like I thought, right. I am gay. This is who I am. And F you if you don't believe, if you don't agree with me. And I, I'm going to have to throw all that down and, and not care if what everybody else thinks and everything. So I really had to come to the end of myself in addiction where, like I said, I really knew that I was going to be a, a, a funeral if I continued. And only under those circumstances, I got down on my knees at the bed and prayed the sinner's prayer I remembered as a kid and truly gave my life to Christ. And it's like, I just want to live one more day, really. It wasn't like, I, I want to be a good person and, and right, be a missionary. Right, right. That, was, that was the farthest thing from my mind. It's like, I want to live one more day. I'm afraid. I don't want to go to hell. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then, then the Lord did a work and washed me clean in his blood and gave me peace that passes understanding and <clears throat> and I could sleep like a log because I wow. knew that I, even if I died in five minutes, I would go to heaven, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's unfathomable. The scales were lifted. I could see the spiritual. I could see that it was Satan, that it's a spiritual Amen. war. Um, then all kinds of stuff. Satan started to reveal himself in my life. I believe the Lord allowed that so that I would be trained to be a soldier, to know know my opponent and know how to fight and to help others do that. And so a lot wow. happened in this first few weeks and months but praise the lord for, for the training amen that's a wonderful testimony man um and, and you know you said you you, you had to talk to yourself you know because it's that fear of i'm gonna have to give all this stuff up that i that i've been living and knowing and and really all i kept hearing was really the scripture um it's not that you had to lay that stuff down it's, it's jesus saying pick up your cross and follow me because like you said it's not like you left all that stuff behind you. You still carry some of that stuff with you. You still had those temptations. That's your cross that you bear, right? Because, but again, Christ says, you know, cast all your cares upon me. He, he says, you know, come unto me and, and I'll bear that yoke with you, you know? Um, so it wasn't that you had to like cast all of that away, but Christ actually just called you and said, pick up your cross and follow me. And I'm gonna walk with you, and that's what that's what it appears he's been doing all this time, you know. He um, saved, saved, he, sorry, 
He who saves his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will find it. And over here, over here as a missionary, have a fulfilling, rewarding, not always easy, but fulfilling, rewarding, satisfying. I have true satisfaction, enduring peace in Christ, even, even on the toughest days. Praise the Lord. So much better than the humdrum of my life before, yeah, just yeah. going in circles and addiction and pornography and just endless and meaningless. And again, not there. really experiencing joy, mm-hmm. you know. Amen. Praise having Lord. maybe a momentary moment of pleasure but no joy no peace like you said because then you could sleep like a log you know all those things didn't come until christ was there with you Amen. all right um all right well i'm gonna stop there um i'll skip my second question i'll just ask you the last question if you were to give someone a statement about god in a simple sentence what would that sentence be how would you explain it or how would you describe god what he means to you, whatever. Faithful. I would say faithful. faithful. Amen. He is truly that. All right. Well, Matthew, again, man, I really appreciate you uh, being on um, with us again. Uh, we didn't have any technical difficulties uh, this time around. Listen, y'all, he has three books out. Um, First being straight, straight to, and then his most recent is We Shoot Our Wounded. Um, I encourage you to pick them up. Um, if anything he said has intrigued you, um, or if you know of anybody that could probably benefit from his story and his testimony, I encourage you. Uh, this could be another way for you to sow into the ministry, purchase the book. Okay. It's both audio, or you can do it on Kindle, as well as um, order, order it on amazon okay Uh, so i would encourage you to do that as well matthew again sir i really 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 do appreciate you um coming on and sharing um i do believe someone was blessed um and someone will be blessed even in the future uh again i truly appreciate you coming on so early so i know it's still early in the morning for you um (laughs) actually early morning next day so i'm actually talking to the future i like i like saying uh, things like that, um, that I get to speak to someone in the future. But um, I truly appreciate you doing and, and sharing your story. I hope um, that when you come back to the States, um, if you're in this area, you and I can get together. I would love for you to come by my church or even just talk uh, to my evangelism ministry um, and just share there as well. But I, I definitely would like to continue uh, this relationship as well. But I do pray for you, man. I, I, I pray. Uh, that the Lord will continue to walk with you and that um, you will meet every divine appointment he has set for you um, and that you will continue to be a blessing in this kingdom. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. And can I say one more thing on the, on the website, on the xgaywitness.com and castawayministries.org, there's a contact button. So if anybody has a private question, like has a family member in the gay life or something has a question they didn't want to ask on during this forum they can click that it'll just come directly to me nobody else will see it and i can respond all right thank you so much for your heart sir um hold on just a moment uh well y'all i i I love the conversation i hope that y'all got something out of it please make sure you take some time to share uh this particular broadcast um you know a lot has been said you know, he reveals a lot things that many of us probably don't think about. And um, I want us to be encouraged to talk about these difficult things. This is what Keep It Real Conversation is all about. It's about having some of the harder, difficult uh, conversations and seeking the answers, you know, um, either through testimony, through witness um, or through God's word. So I'll, I truly enjoyed this. Um, know that I love you. I, I appreciate you all coming back. Um, know that um, I appreciate you as being a part of this community. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, but always remember, as much as I love you, God loved you first. God loved you always. And he loved you by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. And he died for you, just for you. Um, and like we said earlier, when you look at that list in uh, 1 Corinthians, we are all following that list. We all are sinners and we all have our own temptations. We all have our cross to bear that we all have to carry. Um, But 
um, the wonderful thing is that uh, God provides a way for us to do it with him. And um, his name is Jesus Christ. So I look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, same time, seven o'clock. Um, be good, be blessed, and I'll see you then. Sorry, y'all. I clicked the wrong button. I'm, I'm a professional. <laughs> Have a good night.